Well, thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me, and thank you all for attending uh, this talk. It's a pleasure and honor to be here and to share a little bit with you about some of the work that I've been doing at Stanford uh, in electrical engineering. So as was stated, my name is Audrey Bowden. I'm an assistant professor in electrical engineering at Stanford, but my background is more in biomedical engineering, which is what I study for my PhD. And so all of the work that we do uh, is directed towards biomedical applications. Um, obviously, uh, having a background in electrical engineering, uh, what I studied as an electrical engineer uh, was optics and photonics, and so my research program integrates optics for the purposes of biomedical applications. So I'd like to begin just by talking a little bit about why light is even an interesting uh, tool to use for medical applications. Well, first of all, when we're talking about optical photons, at least in the spectral regimes that are normally used uh, for my applications, they're non-ionizing. And if the applications are biomedical in nature, of course, we don't want to kill the patient, so that's a really uh, useful aspect of, uh, of light. Um, the wavelengths that we use, uh, optical wavelengths, allow us to get resolutions that are not attainable with other technologies. Uh, the spectra that we use are very rich in information, and so they can give us a lot of information about the things that we're seeing and, uh, and what we're observing. Uh, information about how light is being absorbed by the specimen can tell us things about uh, the function. We can use also properties of the scattering of light to tell us more information about the morphology and interesting aspects of disease that we're, that we're observing. Uh, the polarization state of light can give us information about uh, the structural anisotropies in systems, and that can tell us, again, about the presence of disease or healthy tissue. And then there are a number of other features, including the fact that light is inherently sterile, which, again, is important for medical applications. One of the things that I think is particularly interesting about light is that uh, as a uh, modality, there aren't really that many features that we can probe or characteristics of light. So there are really a few things that we can measure, and yet there are a diversity of systems that people have developed for biophotonics applications. So a lot of all of these differences in systems are in what I call a black box, and so we're thinking about using light as a tool uh, to connect with various applications and give us information at the structure or functional level. And so, as I mentioned, there are a number of different techniques, many of which you might have heard of, and really the differences between them are um, just the configurations and the way that they're using the same information, but at the end of the day, we're all probing light and light's interaction with uh, materials. What my group likes to do is to think about what's happening inside of that box. So we actually have uh, done some work on developing uh, the probes, thinking about the optical system itself. Uh, we haven't done so much on the electronic processor, but also on the image processing systems. And so the work in my lab really spans a lot of technology development, but then also trying to connect that with various applications. So in my lab, I like to say that we have three main thrusts. Our work intends to uh, advance the state of the art, so we do some work that is purely technology development. Uh, we also try to use the technologies that we develop to then uh, work with scientists to discover new things and also to work with clinicians to deploy these technologies in a way that can be very assistive to biomedical research. The main technology that my lab works on and that I'd like to talk with you today uh, is something called optical coherence tomography. So I'd like to give you a basic background on OCT, as it's called, and uh, how it works. So at its heart, OCT is essentially an imaging modality, much like other techniques for imaging uh, for biomedical applications like ultrasound or MRI. Uh, and one of the distinguishing features of OCT compared to these other modalities has to do with its resolution. So we can achieve spatial resolutions on the order of microns as opposed to, say, millimeters or even centimeters in other um, applications. Uh, the time resolution has gotten really, really fast over the past 10 years, certainly since I developed completed my PhD, and uh, researchers now have really advanced the technology so that we can get 3D volumes in nearly real time. The imaging depth is really where OCT uh, takes a hit. So we get this great resolution, but often at the expense of being able to penetrate very deeply into the body. And this is largely because the body is mainly a big scattering medium, and so light scatters uh, significantly. We can achieve imaging depths that are less than a centimeter, so usually on the order of one to two millimeters, depending on uh, the specific location in tissue. Um, and so for this reason, uh, we often tend to build these OCT systems into probes that allow us to access other parts of the body that we can't necessarily access simply on the exterior. But that said, uh, the OCT systems can be built in a non-invasive way, um, and so we can also, as I mentioned, incorporate them into minimally invasive technologies or technologies that are already being used, like endoscopes and catheters. Another way to think about OCT in terms of what we can see and what we can achieve is to think about technologies that we know, such as ultrasound and MRI, and the types of features that we can see with them. 
So if we think about ultrasound, MRI, and those technologies are usually used on the scale of the human body, and we can see features and details like organs and even um, things smaller than organs. Uh, so the type of details that we can get in the human with these types of technologies are the same types of details that we can achieve with OCT in a much smaller model, so say at the animal level. So their features are, similar, are much, much smaller, um, but we can get the same kinds of details that we might get with humans. So how does OCT actually work? The main uh, phenomenon that we're working with is something called optical backscatter. So the idea here is that we're going to send light into the tissue, and we're going to look for the amount of light that comes back. Uh, the images that we're going to obtain with OCT are going to be what we call cross-sectional images. And just to give you a point of reference for that, if you were to take an image of your hand, for example, and to see the surface palm of your hand, uh, the OCT image would actually be taken by slicing your hand in half and looking at from the side. So you're seeing the cross-section or the layers of tissue inside of your body. So uh, this representative image here is a tadpole uh, viewed from uh, the side. So light comes in from the top, and then at the various boundaries or interfaces of tissue within the sample, uh, light is going to reflect from each of these boundaries based on the refractive index mismatch. And so what we're measuring essentially is the uh, location of each of these uh, interfaces and then also the intensity of light that's reflected. That information is what we call an A scan. So an A scan essentially is a one-dimensional cross-sectional profile of the reflectivity of our sample. Um, if we were to take this A scan and repeat this process at various locations across the sample, we would achieve what we call a B scan, which is what gives us our cross-sectional image. And of course, we can do this in three dimensions and achieve a three-dimensional volume. So as I mentioned, uh, what we're essentially using is a time of flight uh, mechanism to measure uh, where the interfaces are, and that allows us to generate this cross-sectional image. But because light travels very fast, we can't measure its um, the time of flight directly, so we use an indirect method or interferometry in order to obtain this information. Now, the light sources that we typically use for OCT are in the infrared regime, and that's mainly because the applications are biological in nature. Um, biological tissue is filled with water. Water tends to absorb uh, very strongly in certain wavelength regimes, and so we try to pick wavelengths where we're going to have a minimum of water absorption. So the typical wavelengths can range from 830 nanometers up to around 1,310 nanometers. Now, another critical feature of OCT systems is the type of light source in terms of its coherence properties. So the light sources that we often use are broadband light sources, meaning that they have a bandwidth that's roughly 30 to 100 nanometers, and it's from this broad bandwidth that we get our sectioning capability. So our ability to distinguish one interface from another in terms of its position and depth is determined exclusively by the, the bandwidth of the light source that we use. <coughs> So a typical implementation of OCT is essentially an interferometer. Um, so we have uh, a light source, and that light goes into our interferometer, uh, which we can uh, simply use a fiber coupler to generate the interference. So light passes through the fiber coupler. The fiber coupler serves as a beam splitter to send the light in two directions, to a reference arm and to the sample that we're trying to probe. We look for the light that comes back, and that light interferes at the detector, uh, generating what we call an interferogram pattern. Now, there are a few different ways of performing OCT, and uh, uh, one of the standard ways is using what we call a swept wavelength source. So what that means is that the light source is broad in bandwidth, meaning that it has a number of different wavelengths that it emits, but a swept source only emits one wavelength at a time, and that wavelength is sweeping as a function of time. So when we capture this interferogram, we notice that this interferogram has undulations, and these undulations essentially encode the relative position of the reference and the sample interfaces. So in order to generate the A scan or image of these interfaces, we take the Fourier transform. So what I'm showing you here are just representative images of what we can obtain with OCT. On the left-hand side, you can see an image of uh, a finger. Um, so the, uh, the, the surface undulations that you observe are essentially the ridges and valleys of your fingerprint. But what's important is that with OCT, we're not just looking at the surface of tissue, we're also seeing inside. So you can also see the epidermis and dermal junction layer, um, and you can see these structures that are helical in nature, which actually correspond uh, to your sweat ducts. So if you were looking at a live image of your finger under OCT, you would see a motion in those uh, coily structures. On the right-hand side is an image, uh, an OCT image taken of a full eye. And so this image looks like any image that you would obtain with a standard camera, except remember that it's a three-dimensional image, so we can slice this image in any direction, uh, including uh, this one, and take cross-sections of the eye. <coughs> 
So what you're seeing here is a cross-sectional image of the anterior segment or the front of the eye, um, which has the cornea and then the lens, and then the retina would be uh, much further down downstream. OCT technology has actually uh, received a lot of market penetration, particularly in ophthalmology as a clinical application. And another area where it's become quite popular is in cardiology. Uh, that's because there are a number of features that make this technology very uh, amenable to uh, use with patients. And over the past uh, decade or so, actually past two decades or so, uh, the market for OCT has grown tremendously, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but it's a, a stable and exploding research area, and as I mentioned, uh, the technology has infiltrated into lots of different clinical areas and also lots of different designs. So this is just a representative uh, slide showing some of the other areas where OCT is being heavily used. I've already mentioned ophthalmology and cardiology, but other areas, as you can imagine, include uh, more basic biology research, so uh, something like developmental biology, also in dentistry and dermatology, and other non-biological applications. For example, art conservation, uh, because OCT gives you the ability to see below the surface, so this allows you to do non-destructive imaging and testing of, of samples like art. So just to touch briefly on the economic impact of OCT, um, this is something that's being uh, studied uh, currently because uh, the technology has now reached maybe its uh, 20th birthday, 20, it's about 25 years old. So the first OCT papers came out roughly in 1990 and 1991. And really, a lot of uh, research dollars has gone into OCT, and that research dollar, those research dollars have spawned uh, new companies, lots of academic research labs, and in fact, I just have a, a few kind of very general stats here, but dozens of companies, hundreds of research groups, thousands of articles, and ultimately billions of revenue created, and not to mention uh, many patients who've uh, been impacted by uh, OCT specifically. So just to give you a sense of some of the emerging areas of research, um, for OCT today, uh, one of the areas that still remains uh, very strong uh, in interest in the community is increasing the speed. Uh, this is particularly important because ultimately OCT systems are used for patient imaging, and the faster the system, the more patient comfort uh, is allowed. And so uh, there are lots of new type uh, technologies that have come out in order to improve the speed of OCT. And when we think about the speed, oftentimes the metric that people use is the rate at which we can collect that A scan. So oftentimes you'll hear the A scan rate touted or the line rate of the system touted as a basic unit for speed. And today uh, we can get line rates that are on the order of megahertz or tens of megahertz. So this is just two representative examples of systems that are um, really at the cutting edge and leading edge of uh, high-speed applications. So uh, the use of serial time encoding, uh, so passive structures for improving uh, the speed of, of swept sources, and then also um, other types of systems like Fourier domain mode lack lasers. Another important area of interest is uh, being able to access other parts of the body using OCT um, that haven't really been accessible before. So the design of new probes has also emerged as a really hot and important research area. In particular, uh, recently there are some groups who are really pioneering the use of insertion needles uh, to be able to access parts of the body uh, by puncturing uh, the, the tissue, of course. Um, but this also allows them to do a few other things besides just imaging, but also uh, get some functional information like uh, elastography and get mechanical properties. Another uh, really interesting application and uh, probe design is the use of a tethered capsule uh, to access the GI tract. So this allows patients to essentially swallow something that's no bigger than a pill. The alternative was to go under anesthesia and, and sedation, um, and so now this allows the clinicians to be able to image the esophagus without having to put the patient under sedation, which obviously uh, is costly and uncomfortable for the patient. Another emerging area of interest is the um, unity of other modalities, so multimodality imaging, so combining OCT with uh, ultrasound or combining OCT with the ability uh, to ablate tissue so that you can mark it and return there for later biopsies or allow OCT to be used with uh, spectroscopy to get more information uh, that's diagnostic in nature. And finally, uh, the last area that I want to highlight um, as an er emerging research area uh, is that of contrast. So uh, there have been several groups who've been uh, working on using polarization-sensitive uh, OCT uh, as a way to improve the contrast and get information about the depolarization and the biorefringence properties of samples. Um, that work had uh, early inception actually several years ago, but it's really only been recently that people have started to hone in and develop those systems so that they're more stable and can give more quantitative information. And they're also beginning to better understand how disease relates to uh, structural changes.
And so this is done particularly uh, in the eye. There are also a lot of groups, including my own, that are starting to use polarization imaging for uh, skin as well. Uh, and then finally, another area of contrast that's pretty uh, hot in the community is that of angiography. So being able to map where flows are in tissue can give you a, a very good sign of what's healthy and what's not healthy, where there are tumors that are growing, et cetera. So with that background in mind, I'd like to switch gears a bit and just give you uh, an overview of one project that my lab is working on. Uh, and it's more focused on an application, but in getting to that application, we've actually had to develop quite a few technologies. So I'll talk about some of the technologies that my lab has been developing as supportive uh, technologies for OCT research. The main area that I'm gonna focus on is our work uh, in looking at bladder cancer. And this work is being done with a collaborator, uh, Joseph Liao, uh, who's a urologist at the VA and also at Stanford. And the main idea here is that we really wanna transform how bladder cancer is currently managed and also uh, how it's visualized, um, and importantly, to be able to detect it earlier. The work that we're doing uh, is a combination of a novel hardware that we're needing to develop uh, for OCT, um, and then also developing software for visualization, uh, doing image co-registration, and also mosaicing. So uh, for the remainder of the talk, the things that I will mention to you will largely come from a few papers that my group has published and are also uh, pending. So just a little bit of early background on bladder cancer. It's a pretty nasty disease. Uh, yeah. There are many, many cases, in fact, in the US. It's uh, the fourth or fifth most common form of cancer in men. And importantly, what's really problematic about bladder cancer is that it has a very high recurrence rate, meaning that once you're diagnosed with bladder cancer, the chances of you having a recurring event of bladder cancer in your lifetime are extremely high, between 50 and 90%. So as a result, once patients are diagnosed with bladder cancer, they really have to undergo surveillance for new cancers for the rest of their life. And unfortunately, this puts a huge burden on the healthcare system. In fact, bladder cancer is the most costly form of cancer to treat uh, when taken over a patient's lifetime. So think of all the cancers that you know, bladder cancer actually incurs the highest cost. So if we can do something to fix this surveillance process, to catch tumors earlier, um, to reduce the cost somehow in terms of the types of uh, um, uh, therapies that they need to undergo, uh, this would be really, really helpful uh, economically as well as for patients. So as I've already mentioned, uh, patients with bladder cancer have to undergo a lifetime of annual cystoscopies uh, using a tool that's called a white light cystoscope. So a white light cystoscope is essentially an endoscope that goes inside of the body. It's uh, fed um, through the urethra, and it looks around the bladder to see if there are any emerging tumors. We're seeing an image on this on the right-hand side. Now the challenge with white light cystoscopy as it exists right now is that it's great but then it's not so great. So there are certain types of tumors, particularly the earliest stage tumors, um, that it's not able to capture very effectively. In fact, there's a tumor right here um, that is uh, barely visible, and uh, you know, some doctors actually would miss that. So white light cystoscopy in and of itself has some inherent limitations. As I've already mentioned, it has some limited sensitivity. There are some tumors that it just can't see. The other limitation is that uh, if it uh, when it does identify tumors, that it's very difficult for it to be able to assess the degree of this tumor or its stage. And the stage really tells you something about how deeply the tumor has penetrated, and that's really important for the, for the doctor to make a clinical decision about what therapy to apply. And so the ability to stage tumors really means that uh, the uh, technology needs to be able to see what's happening in depth or below the surface. And unfortunately, standard endoscopy, standard cystoscopy is unable to do that. Well, I've already talked about OCT as a technology, and so no surprise here, I'm going to tell you that OCT is actually a promising candidate as a complement to white light cystoscopy. The reason? Because OCT can see below the surface, as we've already established. And seeing below the surface is very important in being able to assess not only is there a tumor present, but then also to identify what stage the tumor is in. So the general principle of operation would be if we can create some kind of probe that would allow us to be inserted into a standard cystoscope, its working channel, uh, we would connect that to an OCT system, and then we'd be able to see uh, and look around the bladder and identify where the tumors are, even at the earliest stages. I've already mentioned uh, what happens here. So the light uh, is illuminating the system. It gets uh, sent to the sample. Uh, we get back this interference pattern that tells us something about where uh, the different interfaces are or where the different layers of the bladder uh, would be. 
Uh, we convert that information into what we call an A scan, so this one-dimensional cross-sectional profile. And then, of course, we can do this in multiple dimensions to get a cross-sectional image or a B scan. So why can OCT uh, images distinguish tumor stages? Well, the bladder wall actually is a complex object that is a multi-layered structure. So there are several layers that are important uh, for being able to identify what's the stage of a tumor. And it turns out that the stage of a tumor correlates specifically with how many of these layers are actually visible in an OCT image. So we can go from healthy tissue, where you can have a very, very um, the dim lamina, uh, urethelium layer and the bright uh, lamina propria layer and the muscularis layer uh, underneath that are all clearly visible. But as you can see, as we progress to higher stages, those layers start to become uh, more fused together. Uh, so as you can imagine, there are some groups that already have done some work with using OCT uh, for bladder cancer, and they've actually shown that OCT can yield a 90 to 100% uh, clinical sensitivity, which is great. Um, so OCT seems like it can improve our sensitivity and also give us the ability to stage. The challenge with existing techniques for doing OCT in the bladder is that so far the systems that have been developed are too large and too slow to integrate with clinical cystoscopies. So as I mentioned, patients annually undergo uh, a cystoscopy for surveillance. Well, that first cystoscopy is often done in the office using a cystoscope that is small and flexible. If the, the doctor finds something that's suspicious, they take the patient to the operating room where they use a larger cystoscope called a rigid cystoscope uh, in order to take the stage, do a biopsy to take the staging. So OCT systems to date for um, bladder imaging have only been able to fit inside of these larger rigid cystoscopes, which means that it's not really able to help with the surveillance aspect, which is really where the need is. Um, so our goal is to first develop a miniaturized version of a probe that would allow us to do uh, imaging in flexible cystoscopes. Secondly, um, we need the speed to be fast enough that we can actually image the bladder uh, in a time that is reasonable. So beyond being able to capture just a single location, we really want to be able to image multiple locations, and this requires us to do fast imaging. So just to put the size and speed requirements a little bit more on the map, uh, just to consider, uh, for the working channels of flexible cystoscopes, we really need a diameter that's smaller than 2.1 millimeters. And in order for us to obtain the speed goals that we have, we need a frame rate that's better than 10 hertz. Um, so this map basically shows you what other people have already been able to achieve. And as you can see, there are no systems that satisfy both the speed and the diameter requirements of uh, the clinical cystoscopy. The designs that do exist, however, are um, notorious. Uh, they are uh, the, the full reviewing pair to angle uh, rotation scanning system uh, is very small, um, but it's too slow. And the micro, um, the MEMS-based devices are also, uh, they're very fast, but their diameter is too large. So one candidate for imaging that actually meets both the speed and size requirements is a scanning fiber endoscope. And so we've been working with um, a collaborator at the University of Washington uh, who uh, has access to this technology. So uh, the scanning fiber endoscope is basically a, a fiber-based endoscope. So it has a fiber cantilever and a piezoelectric actuator. Um, and it's uh, quite small, so the diameter can be uh, just slightly over one millimeter. So it nicely fits inside of that working channel. Um, the way that the imaging uh, works is by using resonant properties to collect a spiral of data. Um, and once we have that spiral, at each of those spiral locations, we collect uh, in an A scan. And so we can then take a cross section of that in order to generate our B scan. To convert this SFE into an OCT imaging uh, scope, we basically add uh, relevant optics. So our initial version uh, that we added was about three millimeters in diameter, which was still slightly too large uh, for the application that we wanted. And more recently, we've been able to develop a smaller version uh, that does meet the correct size requirements. So this is just to put that back on the map. Our version one and version two, where our current version two scope uh, is a technology that actually has hope of uh, fitting into the clinical uh, cystoscope. The challenge is we have this small cystoscope, but with that small size also comes a challenge of the smaller field of view. But like I said, the bladder is a relatively large organ for uh, imaging with OCT, so we need to do something to combat that smaller field of view. Um, the smaller field of view also means that our sampling uh, is much more sparse, and so we need to somehow overcome uh, the sparse volume sampling in order to collect meaningful images. <coughs> 
So the system that we developed, uh, just to give you some specs, has an axial resolution of about nine microns, which is uh, sufficient to be able to distinguish the boundaries of these tumors. Uh, and most importantly, it has a penetration depth of about 800 microns, which allows us to see into the muscularis layer, which is where um, this clinical distinction for uh, treatment occurs. So in order to test the image quality of our system, uh, we first developed a bladder, and a phantom bladder that I'll talk about a bit later, and we also compared it with ex vivo imaging. And our goal was to really uh, address two questions. One, is it possible to be able to distinguish the layers with the probe that we've developed? And then also, can we distinguish healthy tissue from uh, non-healthy tissue? So the image on the left is basically an image taken with our probe uh, that shows uh, with the phantom the various layers of um, the simulated layers of the bladder that we're able to observe. And this also mimics our abil ability to observe these same kinds of layers in actual ex vivo tissue. And then we were also able to mimic with our phantom uh, diseased tissue, which has a fewer number of layers, so these layers have been fused. And we can also see that very well both in the phantom and also in actual ex vivo tissue. So we've proven uh, that we can see these layers and that the diseased tissue can actually be uh, distinguished. So now the question is, um, we need to be able to uh, image a much larger field of view. And so since the field of view of OCT is small, we're going to turn to technique like mosaicing in order to address this. So we're going to be able to take multiple volumes and try to put these volumes together into a larger three-dimensional image that we hopefully can then align with the uh, cystoscope image that we collect from the white light cystoscope. Now the challenge with OCT uh, mosaicing for the bladder is a different challenge from what other people have tried to undertake before. So mosaicing itself is not a new concept. And many of you yourselves might be familiar with doing mosaicing and making panoramic images uh, using the white light images. And oftentimes you can take and identify various features in these images, match them together, and be able to create larger mosaics. The problem is the area over which we're imaging with the OCT probes is much, much smaller. And so the features are essentially non-existent. If you were to take a similar view from the OCT image, this is essentially what you'd get. Okay, it looks a little bit like garbage. And imagine taking a bunch of these images and then trying to mosaic them together. And the problem is not just that we have low noise or low signal to noise ratio. So other groups that have worked on mosaicing in OCT have had a bit of an easier time because they're often trying to work with samples that look like this. So these are the OCT images in the same, uh, field of, uh, same plane and field of view, and obviously there are many, many features that allow them to easily do um, the matching. So what we decided to do in order to address and attack this um, problem of mosaicing was to use the fact that we were actually imaging our um, OCT data in the working channel of a cystoscope that's collecting the white light images. So we take the white light image um, data and actually use that to seed our registration of the OCT. This allows us to expedite the registration process and also gives us features that we can actually use for matching. So to do this, we have to know something about the relationship between the two cameras, the white light camera and the OCT camera, but that being known and assumed to be fixed, uh, we can then figure out what the transformation is between those two images and it allows us to uh, do this uh, registration. So our, our white light image is this larger image that has lots of features. We know that our OCT image is basically just a subset of that, um, but we can take information about the relationship between those two in order to do the mosaicing. So what we do is we uh, take these two OCT volumes and we first decide to align the white light images that correspond with where those volumes were taken. So we take those white light images, uh, we use standard processing to detect the features, uh, we match these features together, um, and then we can identify what the transformation is between the two pairs of images, um, and that homographic transformation allows us to then overlay the white light images. Now, within these white light images, we know where the OCT uh, regions were collected from, so we can use the relationship between uh, these two white light images and then also the transformation between the white light camera and the OCT cameras to now align the OCT images as well. Now, this gives us something in two dimensions because the white light image itself is a two-dimensional image, but remember that our OCT data is a three-dimensional volume, and so we need to have some way of also making sure that the alignment is robust in the Z dimension. So to do that and to expedite the process, rather than doing a full three-dimensional alignment, we simply look at the OCT data, extract the surface, and then try to use uh, the surface position in order to identify a three-dimensional uh, uh, location for each point in the OCT projection. So we take these uh, three-dimensional points, we lift them, sorry, we take these two-dimensional points, lift them into the third dimension, and using the homography between these two data sets, 
uh, we can then match the two OCT volumes together. We also finally do some kind of bundle adjustment on the data in order to make sure that uh, after taking many, many images, we're not, um, uh, we, we're not uh, having problems with the alignments. So uh, finally, uh, the two surfaces have been able to achieve uh, the full volumetric alignment. And to test this, uh, we created a test sample on a piece of printed paper. So we just printed a copy of our, uh, our logo. We embedded it inside of a scattering material to mimic what biological tissue would look like. So this is what a cross-sectional image should look like in that we should be able to see the silicone scattering layer and at locations where we have ink, we should see a dark absorbing region and everywhere else we should be able to see the scattering paper. So this is just an image of uh, a B scan taken of that um, width of this sample so we can see the silicone layer and then of course uh, the absorbing ink layer as well. And this is what the on-fast image looks like for that location. Our single uh, image with our, uh, our small probe is only about one millimeter, um, but we can then uh, use a freehand uh, method to image over the entire sample, and our mosaicing algorithm actually does a good job of doing the mosaicing in three dimensions. So in the end, we can get something that's over 200-fold um, field of view increase, um, and uh, we can also uh, do this same replication in actual bladder tissue. Now that said, we now have a way of uh, getting inside of the bladder uh, using this very small flexible cystoscope, collecting OCT data, making large uh, uh, images. However, what we're still missing is some sense of where that OCT data were taken from. So we can collect this data, but what's not collected at the same time is global information about where that data were collected from. We have all of these individual mosaics, but if we wanted to actually use this information to go back at a point in time, a later point in time, during a future surveillance to track maybe what's going on with that tissue, we, have, we don't have that information in what we've done so far. What we do have are two sets of very, very uh, rich uh, data sets. So we have videos taken from the white light data, and then we also have uh, the OCT volumetric streams. So our next task is to reconstruct a three-dimensional model of um, the bladder so that we can have some sense of globally where we are uh, inside of the bladder and then register the OCT data that we've been collecting to that 3D bladder model. That way, each time the patient comes in, we can actually just register where we took that OCT data from to their anatomical locations of the bladder. So another reason that this might be uh, of interest is for actual surgical uh, preparation. So if the uh, physician who has done um, the clinical cystoscopy with the flexible cystoscope is not always the same person who does the cystoscopy uh, in the operating room with the rigid cystoscope. So they don't know exactly where the tumors are, um, but this would allow them, if we had this uh, nice model, to be able to know exactly where they should be looking for the tumors, and hopefully this would allow them to reduce the time in their surgery. Um, and as I mentioned, again, another reason why this could be useful is um, in order for the clinicians to have an ability to do a longitudinal review of the patient history, um, basically to follow suspicious lesions over time. And as a research community, this is really interesting because then it allows us to start to understand a little bit more about the evolution of cancer um, in this particular case. So overall, we think that um, developing this 3D model um, is going to enable us to transform uh, the practice of bladder cancer management. So by producing a three-dimensional model from uh, the data, uh, it allows us to condense all of this information and give us access to information that the doctors are currently uh, just throwing away, but also to put it into a way that's convenient for them to review. The current practice right now is that if you go for a cystoscopy, they take this very extensive data, but then they throw away the videos and just write a few sparse notes about what tumors they saw and roughly where they are. But all of that information, especially in this age of big data and machine learning, really should be able to be captured and harnessed for a um, more uh, quantitative assessment of how uh, cancer is evolving. So in our work, uh, we've been thinking about first developing this bladder model. And just to give you a sense of uh, some of the things that other people have done and how our work is different, uh, consider that others have already uh, developed some large area panoramas, uh, even with white light images. Um, but the problem is the constructions that they've developed have been largely over flat regions and are limited uh, to portions of the organ and not the entire organ. So this limits the ability to do this longitudinal tracking. Other groups have developed uh, customized equipment which allows them to know exactly where they are so that they can do this reconstruction more easily. Um, but this equipment uh, often uh, is much, much more bulky. And of course, it's difficult to convince doctors to um, take up new equipment that they haven't used before. 
So our goal was to try to use um, the data that we have and do a three-dimensional reconstruction using the standard equipment and workflow. So just in general, uh, what we needed to do was to make sure that we collect a very good uh, data set. So this begins by making sure that we're scanning appropriately, uh, getting uh, good images of the, va the ves vessels and vasculature so that we can put this model together. We ask the doctors to make sure that they do a very thorough examination so that they're um, getting repeated images across the bladder in order to um, close up all of the loops and have all of the data so we can reconstruct the full bladder. And then at the end, uh, we do a pretty short calibration um, just to get some information about the system. So all in all, it turns out that these uh, slight modifications to the current procedure, although using uh, the current uh, equipment, uh, has been really easy uh, to have the doctors adopt. So we've been able to train several residents and also been able to collect data from multiple patients in an IRB-approved study. So our goal is to convert uh, first this white light data into a three-dimensional model. And in order to do that, we use standard algorithms that many in this room are probably familiar with. Um, so uh, we first uh, subsample our, our, our data sets, and then we need to do some pre-processing in order to improve the quality of the images so that we can get better feature detection. So our typical grayscale image uh, is dark. It has a lot of artifacts associated with it. So we've developed an enhanced grayscale that gives us a little bit more uh, information that makes it more robust for the matching. Um, once we have these new grayscale images, uh, we can do the matching, and then uh, we, can able, we are able to use structure from motion algorithms in order to triangulate in three-dimensional space uh, where uh, the images were taken from. That allows us to recover the poses of the cystoscope and to um, put those points uh, on the global map. Once we recover that information, we can then build a point cloud um, from many, many different images. And with that point cloud, we can then create that point, um, take that point cloud, convert it into a, a mesh model. Um, and then the final step, of course, is texturing that model. So we can take images from the original data set, uh, obviously after we've done some enhancements to adjust for the artifacts. And we can map uh, those textures on top of the bladder model that we've created and capture something that is actually equivalent to looking at a virtual cystoscopy. So if this video will play, uh, what you're seeing here is the final reconstructed uh, version of a bladder that we're able to get. And again, what's unique about this is that the data that we're using is actual data that's collected in the clinic without requiring the clinician to modify uh, the equipment that they're using. So we can go inside. Um, and so basically, this is now a way for the, the clinicians to be able to redo or to send the same cystoscopy to someone else so that they can uh, see what's going on and um, you know, also contribute to the diagnosis. So as we pan around, we're able to see some features that are actually located in the patient notes. So for example, uh, the scarring and the papillary tumors. So we're able to generate reconstructions that are actually uh, um, very consistent with what the doctors are actually seeing. So the last step is to now take these bladder models um, and our OCT data sets and now register them together so that we can identify where on the, um, in the global space we actually collected this OCT data from. So the process for doing that involves, first of all, selecting which OCT volumes we're going to um, do the co-registration for. So we detect volumes by determining uh, which volumes, first of all, um, where we have the scope that's visible, um, so that we have a white light image that corresponds with uh, the OCT volume that we collected, and also that we have signal in the OCT data to actually um, um, mosaic and uh, overlay. So the next step involves just simple image processing to identify the position of the scope in the system, or sorry, in the white light images. From that, we can identify uh, where the OCT data were actually collected from. Once we know where the OCT data were collected from, and we also have the pose of the camera, we can then, again, project that onto our three-dimensional model and then identify where the OCT data were taken relative to this model and then overlay that information on uh, the original bladder model. So the last thing that I'd like to mention is just um, that. So we're at the point where we have all of this technology, and um, so you know this technology has taken actually several years to develop, and we are uh, very excited that we now have a probe that we can take into humans. So that's the next uh, the next step of this work. Um, but one other platform that I wanted to mention on the technology development side that's been really important for us to be able to advance this work has to do with development of uh, testing platforms. So in biological research and medical research, uh, oftentimes when you're developing technologies, you want to be able to test them on the actual samples. But sometimes you don't have the actual samples uh, to work with. And particularly when we're working with uh, the bladder and bladder cancer, we don't have that many bladders that we can um, image uh, just for the sake of scientific purposes. 
So alternatives uh, to human subjects uh, would often be in vivo animal studies, but depending on uh, the disease, there might not be uh, animals available. In the case of um, bladder cancer, there's actually not a large animal model for bladder cancer, so this is an uh, inconvenience for us. Um, we can use ex vivo tissue, but as I mentioned, this is not always available. So another um, area where the community in OCT and other uh, biomedical imaging technologies uh, has really started to make some advanced work is in the development of what we call optical phantoms. So optical phantoms are essentially fake tissue or fake body parts uh, that mimic many of the various features that we would expect to see um, in uh, the actual biological tissue. <coughs> So in the case of the bladder phantom, uh, we developed a phantom that would replace our ability to be able to do in vivo imaging. Um, and so this meant uh, mimicking a few features. On the side of the white light cystoscopy, uh, we wanted to mimic the fact that the surface appearance is actually quite rough, and so we needed something that was textured. Uh, there are also vascular patterns that we want to be able to observe. Um, it needs to be compatible with the clinical equipment and the current clinical processes. And then also we need to make sure that it has that three-dimensional structure uh, so that we can uh, really mimic the bladder. On the OCT side of things, we need to do something uh, to mimic the various bladder layers and uh, their correspondence with various disease states. Um, so the layers have to have controlled thicknesses, and then we also need to be able to control their optical properties um, via scattering. So one of the early phantoms that we developed uh, is shown on the left here. And the main advantage of this phantom was that it was fully three-dimensional and enclosed. Um, and uh, you can see on the right-hand side that we're able to uh, fill it and um, cause it to uh, remove the air from it, voiding similar to what a clinician would actually do during a normal procedure. Um, so developing this phantom required us to establish uh, new fabrication te techniques. Um, and to also revisit some techniques that have been used before, but mainly in the context of two dimensions and not three dimensions. So as I mentioned, uh, another thing that we wanted to do with our, the second version of the phantom that we developed was to not only look at uh, aspects that are important for white light cystoscopy, but to be able to mimic a larger range of disease states in, uh, in the tissue. So in addition to being able to uh, identify flat tumors, we also wanted to be able to mimic uh, papillary tumors, which are larger growth structures uh, that ex exude um, from the surface of the tissue. And then on, um, we also wanted to be able to mimic uh, what this phantom might look like under blue light cystoscopy, which is another emerging modality that's being used for bladder cancer. And so in that case, uh, these flat tumors, which are hardly visible under white light cystoscopy, um, become highly visible under this fluorescent technology. So we needed to add some sort of pigmentation in order to be able to uh, see um, uh, these tumors under fluorescent illumination. And then finally, uh, under OCT, as I mentioned, it was important to be able to see the bladder wall, and we needed to have uh, a new procedure so that we can mimic uh, the various range of diseases from the early stage cancers all the way to the late uh, stage cancers. So this required us, as I, as I mentioned before, to be able to control the thickness and also the scattering properties. So the phantom that we developed uh, is a three-dimensional phantom, and so we were able to use uh, 3D printing in order to create the manifold. Um, in order to design uh, the material that the phantom is made from, we needed to actually uh, identify a material that was highly elastic so that it could be removed from the mold. And for this, we actually turn to uh, the costume industry, uh, where they're very used to using uh, very elastic materials to remove over faces and other things like that. So the material that we settled on is something called dragon skin, which is highly elastic, um, but it's not optically transparent. So we needed to do some work to establish its optical tunability and suitability for this project. So we did find that uh, dragon skin is optically tunable. One easy way of tuning uh, uh, the the optical properties of dragon skin, particularly its scattering, is to embed um, particles, uh, scattering particles like titanium dioxide uh, at various ratios, and this gives us a large range of attenuation coefficients due to scattering. In order to uh, adjust the color of the tissue, uh, we could um, add various dyes. Uh, for example, we were able to use something as simple as red Sharpie dye to alter the color, um, and then we were able to uh, identify invisible fluorescent pigments that look invisible under white light imaging, but also add contrast when viewed under fluorescence. In order to achieve uh, the various thicknesses of the layers that we needed, we needed to come up with a new method for um, getting this large range of very small thicknesses on the order of 10 to 20 microns, all the way up to uh, nearly a millimeter. 
Now, the traditional way of uh, making layers uh, in phantoms has been spin coding, but that's really only been useful in two dimensions. And so we again turned to the costume industry for some inspiration for this. And so we use a, a spray painting and spray coding in order to be able to make very thin layers of arbitrary shapes. We were able to characterize quantitatively the amount of thickness that we would get after spraying for different amounts of time. So the overall fabrication process involved first 3D printing a mold, then spray painting uh, the first layer, the urethelium. We identified uh, something that we could use to mimic the, ves the vessel pattern, so we would add vessels onto our phantom. We would spray coat the next layer, uh, the lamina propria, which was a bit thicker and also had different optical properties. Uh, and then we would use a technique called um, sandwich molding that we developed in order to create the much more thicker muscularis propria later. And then uh, afterwards, we would remove the outer mold I'll remove our post in phantom and add tubing in order to mimic uh, the urethra so that our full phantom uh, is now something that's able to be uh, imaged with a, with a cystoscope and is fully enclosed. So just a few pictures of uh, the outcome. So this is on the top. You can see uh, what healthy tissue looks like under the various modalities that we cared about. Um, and then on the bottom, you can see our phantom uh, very well mimics uh, many of the features of uh, the healthy tissue. Um, so not only the coloration and the appearance of vessels, but kind of the, the slight illumination in the, in the blue light cystoscopy. In the case of inflamed tissue, we were able to uh, mimic the uh, slight redness appearance uh, under uh, white light cystoscopy and the slight fluorescent appearance under blue light cystoscopy, but the maintained layer structure under OCT. And in cancerous tissue, um, we can mimic various types of cancers. Uh, the appearance is much uh, more red under white light, and then also the fluorescence appearance is much more concentrated. And importantly, under OCT, uh, the layers are removed. So as I mentioned, uh, developing this phantom is a really important tool to help us, um, with, that was a really important tool to help us characterize and develop all of the technologies that are now uh, leading us to be able to use uh, our probe in order to uh, do in vivo imaging of humans. So in the interest of time, I don't have time to talk about uh, the other projects that we're working on, but I just wanted to mention briefly a few other clinical areas that we are interested in uh, for OCT work. So one is in detecting skin cancer, and in this area we are using polarization-sensitive OCT to be able to give us better contrast um, because it turns out that there are molecules in the skin uh, that uh, do depolarize the light as uh, the tissue becomes more cancerous, and we're using this to be able to automatically de uh, detect cancer in images to hopefully be an assistant to uh, primary care physicians who don't have access to the same uh, expertise of a dermatologist. Uh, another project that we've been working on uh, has been looking at cochlear mechanics and trying to understand a little bit better uh, how hearing works. Um, so we've been using OCT to really understand how structures in the ear are vibrating as they respond to uh, various uh, sound inputs. Um, and then finally, the last clinical project that we've been working on has been thinking about using OCT to better predict um, embryos that are viable in in vitro fertilization um, process procedures. So on the top, you can see uh, images taken with OCT um, for a healthy embryo uh, that hasn't been frozen. Uh, on the bottom, you can see the very distinct patterns that are created when our embryos are frozen. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can basically see two images that are obtained under the standard uh, of care, which is bright field microscopy. Those two images look pretty nearly the same, so they're undistinguishable to clinicians right now. And clinicians really need some kind of hope and help uh, for being able to identify uh, which embryos are most likely to be viable. So uh, with that, I'd like to just thank all of my students who've been doing this uh, brilliant work and also the postdocs in our group, um, as well as my collaborators who have been really great to work with, a really great inspiration, um, and who've been very, very supportive. And also my research support that's really enabled this work to be able to be continued. And of course, all of you, my audience, for uh, attending this talk today. Thank you. <laughs>